Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you may have tuned in. Welcome to today's Information Week webinar, Optimizing Returns from Your Cyber Risk Program, sponsored by BitSight and broadcast by Informa. Terry Sweeney here with Information Week, and I'll be your moderator today. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. If you've been here before, you know that this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, and share the presentation on social media. This is also where you'll participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of today's presentation. If you've been here before, you also know that the slides will advance automatically. You can also download a copy of the slides using that resources widget at the bottom of the screen. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll also be asking you to provide feedback by clicking on the survey widget. Please take a minute to fill this out. Your feedback does indeed provide us valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the help button at the bottom of the screen. You can also type your issue into the Q&A area and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. So let's move on to the presentation, Optimizing Returns from Your Cyber Risk Program. Discussing today's topic is Greg Keshian, Senior VP and General Manager for BitSight, along with his colleague, Vanessa Jankowski, also Senior VP and General Manager for Third Party Risk Management at BitSight. <clears throat> Excuse me. To learn more about our speakers, you can find their bios in that speaker bio box on the program console. We're going to try something just a bit different today. Rather than have our speakers go through longer series of slides, today's format is going to be a bit more conversational between Greg, Vanessa, and myself. Um, of course, we want you to be part of the conversation too, so please don't be shy in sending over your questions by clicking on that question mark icon. So uh, let's let's get right into it. Um, Kesh, we really can't talk about risk management without also bringing in exposure management. Uh, kick us off, um, why is exposure management such a big issue these days? Yep, thanks Terry, and uh, great to be with everybody today. So yeah, exposure management is a, is a huge issue for a lot of companies that they've been dealing with for years, um, but you can actually sort of looking at really the amount of money and energy that companies are spending on their various digital transformation initiatives. Um, and so, you know, in, in the last several years, um, the amount of energy that companies have been putting into digital transformation has been significant, but especially starting with um, COVID and, uh, you know, all of the changes that took place after the pandemic began, um, this type of shift has really accelerated even further. And so you can see last year alone, companies were estimated to have spent about $2 trillion on digital transformation initiatives. Um, and you can see the acceleration of, of really the growth rate um, in spending on these initiatives with really no sign of uh, slowing coming up into the future. And so what happens is, you know, companies are, are spending all sorts of resources to create um, new digital infrastructure and digital processes but that also with it creates kind of a, a sprawl of that infrastructure that um, security leaders need to keep up with and maintain. And then you also see this distribution of the workforce um, starting with the COVID pandemic where you know, more people are working remotely or from various locations, um, perhaps on different and unfamiliar networks that the, that the company hasn't seen before. So it's, it's creating kind of a, a growing problem here um, and, and really it's all started by the fact that companies are trying to move so many of their processes um, online in recent years, and that's accelerating pretty significantly. Um, Vanessa, also, you can comment on kind of the, uh, the third-party risk management uh, aspect of the problem too. Yeah, absolutely. And Kesh, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? COVID really triggered this massive acceleration of digital transformation, and what that has led to is really a shift shift in how businesses operate. And so just about every company has had to become a technology company. And what that's meant is that, as you said, there's a new mode of work, but there's also a new mode of operating period. So there's a heavier reliance on 
a much more digital supply chain. And so as we've seen the growth in digital transformation spending, we've seen a, a growth in the digital footprint, the digital, digital supply chain. And unfortunately, what's happened in parallel to that is, um, you know, an increase in bad things happening. And so we've seen, again, a heavier reliance on third party vendors, especially looking at software and software products. And so what's happened is that we've seen um, in parallel to this, more zero days, we've seen more um, vulnerabilities, more known exploited vulnerabilities. And so organizations are really having to grapple with, with this sort of influx of bad events um, that is just becoming more complicated by nature of the digital supply chain that's grown over the last few years. It's really, um, again, more, more vendors, bigger digital footprint, more to control, and I think more difficulty in actually keeping that exposure in check. Well, I guess all that begs the question of, of why exposure is such a difficult problem to solve. But Vanessa, your, your slide makes it look like COVID provided basically a, an all-you-can-eat 24-hour buffet for, for bad actors. I, mean, I know that's a little uh, maybe glib or overstated, but th there's some truth in that, no? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have felt it. And so I think organizations who are trying to get a handle on exposure to, to these kinds of threats have really felt it over the last few years because there's more pressure from cyber insurers, there's more pressure from regulators, there was more pressure from boards who are all saying, we need to get a handle on this. And as bad actors have really taken advantage of this bigger digital footprint, this bigger digital supply chain that really cuts across the globe and across industries, it's hard to keep up. And that's true for both the first party and the third party perspective. Kesh, I think we've also seen in tandem with, with the, the explosion of bad actors, um, it, it strikes me that the, uh, the profile of the network um, is constantly changing. So that makes exposure that much more challenging to, to gauge, to protect against. Yeah, I imagine you have some thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I would describe exposure management as kind of a constantly evolving problem. And if you think about the role of a, of a CISO inside of an organization, as well as their teams, these are people on teams that are you know, tasked with making sure that the, uh, you know, the digital infrastructure and the data of the company remains secure, but they are not always or even often responsible for creating that infrastructure. And frequently they don't have any sort of uh, notice as to when it's going to be created. So essentially what you have and what we, what we hear all the time from our customers is, you know, you've got your IT team, they're over here creating some sort of new infrastructure. You've got marketing teams that might be setting up um, new web, web pages and websites. Um, you have development teams that are creating new applications and environments all the time. And so, you've got your security team that's tasked with keeping all of that secure, um, but they really are lacking significant visibility into what exists, especially inside of a large organization that has, you know, um, uh, kind of a footprint, footprint that spans across the globe. And so when you have that type of sprawl of your, of your network and your infrastructure, it makes it very difficult to get an understanding of what your full footprint actually looks like um, what the exposure issues within that are, um, how to prioritize the problems that you might have, and then you know how do I take action on these exposure issues that come up when they take place? How do I make sure that the right person to fix an issue is is assigned to it, um, and that they have you know the right order that they're fixing things in because not all of the issues are are kind of created equal. Um, so it's so it's a huge problem for your own. Uh, infrastructure and then you know Vanessa it, of course extends into the supply chain too so I'm, I'm curious what the challenges that you see um, in the in the supply chain are yeah incidentally it's all the same problems right you're you're in the third party perspective you're basically taking all the same challenges that you described for your your own organization your own enterprise and just multiplying it by tens or hundreds or thousands of vendors you're trying to understand hey where do I have um, where is my footprint? Who makes up my footprint? Who are the vendors that I need to worry about? Um, and at what level? I need to be able to understand where I have exposure issues across that, that broader supply chain. Um, I need to understand what software they're using, what, what tools and technology they have in place that might represent a risk for me. 
Um, and then I have to be able to prioritize. So Kesh, just like you explained for the first party experience, you've got a number of different issues. They're not all created equal. When you apply that to your third party vendors or suppliers or partners, you've got that same problem. How do I prioritize across potentially, again, hundreds or thousands of different issues that I can focus on on any given day? And then how do I actually sort of make those decisions? How do I actually take action to drive reduction in that exposure, reduction in that risk in a way that's going to benefit not just me, but also my vendors. You know, I want to make sure that they have a good program in place. I want to make sure that they are able to actually help help me keep my business safe and keep my business running. So it's a really big challenge. It's um, very, very complicated, but also I think becoming more and more important every day. Just a point of information here. Uh, we, we hear a lot, of course, about um, hybrid work models where uh, employers are either encouraging or requiring workers to be in the office uh, a few days a week, uh, but still allowing work from home. Um, from what you've just described, um, it, it feels like supply chain issues have completely overtaken the, the, the work from home issues and vulnerabilities and um, the, the risk associated with that, that expanded um, attack surface. Is, is that an accurate view? Uh, is, is supply chain really where most of the focus is for the customers that you talk to? I think our customers are dealing with a lot of different things at once, and that's part of the challenge. They're trying to really manage how they view risk within their own organizations. They're trying to understand what does my footprint look like and how has that changed as we've moved into a more of a hybrid work model. And then they also have to deal with all these same issues from a third party perspective. I think what's drawn um, perhaps more focus on the supply chain issue is the, the slide that you, you see now where we have more and more bad events happening through the, through the supply chain. And so you look at different types of enterprise software, you look at vulnerability vulnerabilities in products like MoveIt, for example, or um, Barracuda or Fortinet or whichever, whichever solution it may be. And these are products that are used by businesses. And so as you encounter zero days, when you encounter other problems that are really rooted in the software bill of materials for the enterprise, you have a really big challenge to grapple with, again, both within your business as you try to figure out, is, does this, is this a product that we use? Is this a solution that we are you know, exposed to or a vulnerability that we are exposed to? And then how do I sort of think about that when I expand the lens or widen the aperture to look at my full digital, digital footprint and my full attack service? Um, I think you get, you are challenged with visibility in both cases and you're challenged with prioritization, you're challenged with the ability to actually drive change in a quick quick turnaround time in both cases. Does that help? Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd like to open that aperture just a little bit wider if we could and uh, address, if, if, if you both will, uh, some of the common issues that, that companies are looking to solve um, that are related to exposure management. Can, can you enumerate some of those? Yeah, I, I can jump in. So, I mean, the kind of the foundational one is just a lot of companies lack visibility into what exists, both in terms of what um, infrastructure I actually own as an organization that I need to um, maintain responsibility for, as well as, you know, my within my supply chain, um, what what does that actually look like comprehensively and, and where do I have exposure there? Um, and then, on top of that, it's like first you need to know what you're actually dealing with in terms of your full digital footprint and your full ecosystem. From there, then you need to know, okay, what are the issues that exist in that footprint? Um, you know, what are the vulnerabilities that either I have or perhaps um, my vendors have? And then after that, you have another challenge, which is, okay, and now I have a huge list of things because I have everything that I need to fix of my own. And then like Vanessa said, you multiply that by a hundred or by a thousand um, to get, gain an understanding across your vendor network. And so you, you then end up with a prioritization challenge of where do I start? You know, what are the most impactful things that I need to fix or I need to ask one of my vendors um, to address in order to reduce my exposure the most? Um, and so we, you know, we see a lot of our customers facing those types of challenges. Um, you know, an example of a customer that um, we've helped with a number of these things uh, is a company called Bearing Point. Um, so they're a global consulting firm. 
they really needed help to, first of all, understand what their own infrastructure really looked like across the globe. Um, they have a really vast footprint that literally extends into almost every uh, country around the entire world. Um, and so they needed to understand that. And they also needed um, to understand what was happening inside of their vendor network. And so the way that um, one of the folks inside of Bearing Point kind of described the problem is with hundreds of thousands of assets on the internet and cloud instances being spun up every day, we needed visibility into where cybersecurity falls short. And so BitSight was able to provide um, some of that visibility both for the infrastructure that um, Bearing Point owns themselves, as well as um, they really needed a better approach to the way that they were handling their vendors. Um, previously, everything was quite manual um, and required a lot of work through questionnaires. And they, they wanted a real time understanding of what the exposure um, within their vendors actually looked like. And so we were able to, to really help them address problems both uh, you know, inside their, their own company as well as externally inside of the supply chain. Vanessa, anything to add there? No, I mean, I think that the next the next really interesting question is how do how did we help? How do we do that? Because I think one of the things that I'm I've been really excited about this particular case is is that they they really are they're a global organization. They've got a really big challenge in terms of getting visibility, getting getting an ability to prioritize. Um, and so as we think about what like what are some of the things that it took to actually make that happen? So Kesh, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the sort of underpinning capabilities that drove that? Yeah, so um, kind of one of the starting points is in the, you know, the detection of which assets companies have and then kind of mapping those back to that organization so that they know, okay, this is actually mine. Um, and in the case of, of Bearing Point, the company has an interesting history where it had been around for quite a while um, and you know various pieces of bearing point had been spun out of other companies and so you had you know kind of all of this legacy infrastructure and it was in some cases ambiguous actually as to, to who owned it and and which aspects were um, connected to which other pieces and so the starting point um, was in just detection of which infrastructure bearing point really had and um, you know a lot of a lot of folks aren't necessarily aware of this but BitSight actually does have a really significant investment um, in scanning infrastructure to really understand all of these different assets that are out there and connected to the internet, um, as well as you know, detecting what type of issues they might have on them or, or other properties of those assets. So you know, we start with kind of um, outlining the footprint and that helps um, you know, the organization bearing point in this case to really understand what their full attack surface looks like. Um, and then from there, gain an understanding of what the exposure issues are that exist um, across that attack surface. So you know, what vulnerabilities do they have? Um, what types of misconfigurations might they have or, or other issues that the team would want to address? Um, and then you also need to be able to do that you know, kind of across not just the infrastructure that you know you own, but once you have a handle on that, um, do that across your vendor network as well. And that's what we refer to really as the extended attack surface is both your, uh, your infrastructure and assets plus that of your supply chain as well. Um, and so Vanessa, maybe you want to comment on um, some of the aspects that we were helping Bearing Point with uh, from a third, par third party standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, as you said, it's a big global organization and they have clients all over the globe. And so what they have built is an, is a vendor network that they rely on to have, help them actually execute against their client solutions, their client strategies. And so when they brought BitSight on board, what they were able to get is this really quick transparency into how their vendors were performing, how they were doing from a cyber risk standpoint. And what that meant was that they have been able not just to get the visibility, but also to do those next, next things that we talked about is prioritization, um, and then actually drive risk reduction, drive exposure reduction through their vendor population. And so it's been, um, I think, a really powerful thing for them because it helped it helped them solve some real problems when it comes to exposure across the digital ecosystem. Um, and so one of the things that I, I really love about this story is that they weren't, weren't just you know passing things over the fence. They were actually doing this in a way that was really collaborative. 
And so their vendors were appreciative of the information that they were able to share through some of the scanning that Bitsite provided to say, we're, act we're, you know, we're helping our vendors make their programs better. The vendors are grateful because they're able to, <laughs> able to improve their own exposure. And so that's been, I think, a great thing, but it's also something that can really scale. And so as more organizations do this, I think we're going to see a better overall sort of industry posture when it comes to, um, you know, exposure management, supply chain resiliency generally. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, and I think one of the other aspects is, you know, because you see companies with, um, you know, footprints that are so, so big, prioritization, like Vanessa mentioned, is, is huge. And within your own network, being able to understand, you know, how do I prioritize the work that I want to do based on a combination of, like, how important is this asset um, to my company, as well as what's the severity of the issue that exists on it? Because we're finding teams that are constantly challenged with just not having enough resources, um, you know, either human or, or otherwise to be able to address all of the work that there is to be done. To be done. And so... Um, when you're in that situation and there's more work than the team could ever hope to accomplish, prioritization is really your only tool. And so we aim to help our customers really significantly to figure out, okay, what are the top items that we want to do so that even if we don't get through this whole list of things, because we never will, um, how do we make sure that we're making the biggest possible impact that we can with the resources that we have? Yeah, I think part of it too is making sure that, and this is, I think is especially true on the third party side is taking that, once you've got that prioritization in place, how do you how do you actually manage the execution of the work? And so one of the problems in the third party risk space is that there are so many vendors, <laughs> there are so many problems and you, you have limited control. You've got limited agency over the actual problem solving, right? You can share information, you can be collaborative, you can help your vendors see what you see. Um, but even that can take work. And so one of the things that we've been focused on is how we actually help drive some of that scale, how we help drive some of the automation that makes it possible to do the kind of outreach that's needed to actually drive that, drive that mitigation, drive that, that information sharing. I mean, what you're spelling out here is, is also a great way for supply chain partners to, to keep each other abreast of, of, of the exposure and risk issues and not just, protect individual pieces, but also the supply chain in the aggregate. Is 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 that part of what you were envisioning with this? Yeah, look, I mean, I think one of the things that we have believed for a really long time is that there's power in the, the network of folks who are all sort of focused on leveling up, leveling up the security posture, leveling up um, the exposure posture from an industry perspective. And so having the ability to share information, having the ability to drive improvement in one part part of the population should be good for everybody and so the more we can sort of promote promote that kind of sharing promote that kind of um i think adoption adoption of a standard to some degree to say hey here's here's what's expected and here's what's possible um in terms of getting that level of visibility in a way that helps you actually again be a, an agent of change for improvement is um is really powerful but i think from a from a bit site mission perspective it's definitely core to how we think about things because we we want there to be a, a broader leveling up. Kesh, anything you would add to that? I I, I think that's a good uh, no. I think that's a good summary. Excellent. Um, Vanessa, talk to us a bit about how Bitsight's own exposure management product differentiates itself from from other solutions that are out there. Yeah, I mean, I. I I think the biggest thing is what, what we've been talking about the last few minutes, which is really the ability to see past your immediate perimeter and into the broader digital footprint that you've got. And so I think a lot of, um, you know, a lot of solutions on the market are really focused on your internal perimeter um, and what you like, how you look as a, as a single enterprise. Um, but what's unique about BitSight is that we're really looking much more, more broadly. And so we're widening the aperture. We're looking not just at your own organization and your subsidiaries, but also looking at um, your third parties and your fourth parties and saying, hey, this is the full picture um, so that you have an ability to again, drive drive change, drive improvement from an exposure perspective in a way that I think is both unique and really powerful in terms of risk reduction. Because a lot of the, again, the, a lot of the major events, a lot of the big problems that we've seen across the cyber landscape over the last few years have really been rooted in the digital supply chain. And so as we think about the use of a third party product um, and how that sort of plays out 
across your vendor landscape, across your own organization, across your fourth parties and fifth parties and nth parties, there's a real benefit to having a full picture. Um, and BitSight's able to provide that. And I think that's pretty, pretty special. Nice. That's what you, what do you think? Yeah, so there's a, uh, everything that you said for sure. And then there's another aspect that I think is quite unique about BitSight and how we help companies with their own security programs, which is what we've been talking about so far is related to exposure, which is, which is essentially, you know, what, um, what do I have out there and what has an immediate problem on it that I'd need to fix right now? Um, because it's, it's sort of an open wound. Um, we of course help with that problem, but then on top of that, we have a, a tremendous number of metrics and, and sets of analytics that help our customers to get to kind of the root cause of why they had those exposure issues in the first place so that they can build a healthy program. And that we would actually categorize as performance, right? So exposure is kind of the near term, um, like what's on fire right now. Performance is measuring, okay, what are you doing in your, in your program um, that is either going to lead you to be in a healthy posture or is going to likely lead you down the path to becoming you know, kind of exposed in the future. And so an example here is we measure a company's patching cadence, like how quickly do they actually patch, um, you know, servers that, that need a new version um, and the like. And so maybe you have no vulnerabilities today at all. And so your, your exposure is zero, but um, maybe you're quite slow to patch. And so your, your patching cadence grade is actually quite poor. That's the type of metric that helps you to actually get to the root cause of these issues and put process in place um, that puts you on strong footing into the future. And then the, the other thing that these performance metrics allow you to do is as a security leader, take really useful and valuable information about your program, um, both upwards to you know report to other executives or up to the board or perhaps outwards um, you know, to your customers or to your shareholders to show, hey, I have a solid program that's in place. It can be measured independently by BitSight, who's looking at us um, you know, externally and, and measuring how effective we are in these different areas of our program. So it's very useful for that type of reporting aspect. And then it's also very useful as a security leader to, to hold your team accountable um, you know, to make sure that you have strength in your program and, and a good process in place. So it's really this um, like up leveling of the conversation, you know, identifying the exposure and addressing all of the issues there, of course, to deal with the, the near term issues, but then being able to um, gain some visibility into why things are going the way that they are so that you can make the longer term improvements to your program um, to drive strength that I, I think uh, really does, um, you know, put BitSight in a, in a unique position relative to some of the other companies out there. Yeah, and that's, that's a really powerful thing on the third party side of the house too, because as you think about how you engage with third parties from a cyber risk perspective, being able to take that sort of ob objective language that travels from one vendor to the other um, gives you an ability to, to sort of vet, vet that performance at the front end of your relationship and also use that to identify some of the things that, that Kesh mentioned and saying, okay, it looks like maybe patching cadence is not so strong. Um, that's something that we want to identify up front so that if there is remediation that's needed or if there is some improvement or change that's needed at the front end of the relationship, you have an ability to actually see that when you're engaging with them um, at the start of your sort of vendor-customer uh, relationship so that you can drive drive some impact and then also see how it's changing over time um, so that you are not just waiting for the next bad thing to happen, but you can actually get a, get a handle on here's current state, here's the baseline, here's what I expect from a vendor of this, you know, of this level of criticality to my business. Um, so better decision making across the board, but also some process efficiency that's really, um, I think, essential in today's environment where businesses are asking to, to do more with less <laughs> generally. Information Week writes a lot about the, the regular disconnect between the boards of directors, the, the executive committee, um, and the, the 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 IT people the the security professionals um, they they do speak different languages so I think what you're pointing to here is here's here's actually a nexus between um, the risk language that the the 
the directors and 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 boards are are tasked and legally bound to to deal with um with the 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 the, the bits and bytes the 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 exposure pieces that the IT and the infosec pros are are also uh, charged with with doing in their own jobs um you've you've created a channel here between them like suddenly they they might actually be able to hear each other in in what they have to say um was was that your intention with this? Um, I don't know if it was the the original intention all the way back when the company was founded, but it's certainly something that many of our customers have latched on to um, in recent years. And I think the way that you put it uh, is is really apt. It's like you know at the, at the very highest level, you need some metrics that you can show to the either your board or to the outside world that are very very simple to understand and that are comparable so that it's not just some meaningless metric that people have a very difficult time understanding. But, you know, if you think about one of the um, sort of the highest level KPIs that BitSight provides, it's the BitSight rating, which is, you know, one number that reflects um, the overall performance of a company's security program. And the very nice thing about that number is it's comparable across uh, different companies. So whether I'm, a, you know, I'm assessing my vendors against each other, or whether I'm talking about my own security program, I can layer in some context behind it, and I can say, hey, hey, we're performing like this, and relative to um, to our industry peers, you know, we're in the top 25 percentile or, or something along those lines. And that's a really helpful type of metric for a board of directors to engage with as a starting point, and then you can continue to sort of decompose that further as you go down. And so, um, you know, you might start with the rating, but then decompose that into the different risk vectors in a board setting to understand where investments in the company's security program ought to go. But then for the security teams, they can take that multiple levels deeper to understand the specific issues and the findings within those uh, risk vectors that they need to address and, and, you know, attack those in a priority order um, to make sure that they're having the biggest impact. So it really is a system that, you know, you could view it in either direction, either like all the way from these very granular security observations being rolled up to one high level number, or, you know, for the executive audiences, t typically they would start with the high level number and then kind of dig deeper into it. Um, you know, but it's, it's definitely really helpful for bridging that gap between either executives, board members, investors, um, and you know the security teams that they're trying to have the the conversation with. Excellent. Um, I just want to remind our audience to to input questions for both Kesh and and Vanessa. Um, we're going to close out here. Vanessa, take us out. Um, what what's one thing that our listeners can do that would improve their exposure management experience? Yeah, I guess if I had to give one piece of advice, I would say don't wait, don't don't wait for the next bad thing to happen. You know, it's sure. happen, it's gonna come, it's gonna happen probably at five thirty on a Friday, maybe you know, right right before a holiday, no doubt. Um, but if you can get visibility into your attack surface now, if you can get visibility into sort of your attack surface, including your supply chain now, you're going to be in a much better position to actually deal deal with whatever happens. Um, having a sense for what you know, what your attack surface looks like, where you have exposure today, um, what kinds of, you know, products and tools and technology are sitting there today, I think will give give folks a lot of leverage to make sure that they are actually in a position to, you know, manage through the next big thing. And so I would say, don't wait, get ready, make sure you've got the visibility you need to actually make a difference when, when it happens. Well, Kesh and Vanessa, thank you both. Uh, you have uh, challenged our ideas about uh, risk and exposure management um, and uh, also offered some solutions on how to improve the, the effectiveness and reach of both. So th thank you both very much for that. Um, before we start with uh, the q and I I just want to direct audience attention to the webinar survey that's available on the bottom of the presentation window. Again, thanks in advance for filling that out. Your participation allows us to better serve you. So let's let's move right to the Q&A. Um, uh, a, a really great just definition question. Um, 
an audience member is asking how exposure management differs from conventional threat management. Kesh, do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I mean, I tend to think about the threat side of the equation as the, you know, as the people that are, um, you know, trying to break into your systems or steal your data, whereas exposure has more to do with the systems themselves and, and what you have. And so, you know, we focus a lot on the exposure because, you know, in some cases, um, you know, the threat hasn't taken place yet. Like somebody hasn't taken action to try to, you know, hack into your systems or steal your data or, or something along those lines. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean that you should let your guard down. And so, um, so anyways, that, that's how I would kind of differentiate between the two is, you know, we're helping to make sure that our customers have a full understanding of all of the, the digital infrastructure that is theirs, as well as an understanding of what's happening inside of their vendor network. Um, and then, you know, kind of a, a list of the different exposure issues. These could be things like vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, um, you know, open ports, things like that, that they ought to address to make sure that there isn't, you know, an attack vector, vector for um, a threat actor to take advantage of. Vanessa, did you want to add to that? No, I think that was well said. Yeah. Um, so uh, an audience member is, uh, is, is pushing back a little bit against, um, Vanessa, your, your comment about starting early. Um, uh, they're, they're obviously up against um, the, the time involved to get business approval for projects like these, um, as well as the, the pressures that bad actors place on them with the, the unrelenting um, malware that, that comes uh, their way. Um, boy, you, you can never start too early, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, there's just these unrelenting pressures that, that, that really, really do push people in, 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 in these times, right? Yeah, that's right. I think, look, what, I, what we hear from our customers a lot is that they feel like they're, <laughs> They're in a race against time, right? They're trying to make sure that they are prepared for when the next big thing happens because they know they know it's going to happen. And so I think having as much of a playbook in place as possible, as much information as possible, um, puts you in the best position possible. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be, um, you know, easy, right? But I think having sure. having that conversation now, having that business case in place to say, here's here's what's on the line. Here's where we have. Um, you know, here's where we have exposure today, here's where we have risk today, I think can be really powerful in, um, again, equipping the business to really manage through the challenges. It's about resiliency and making sure that, hey, we have the tools, we have the information to actually um, be in a place to respond next time. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you can't start early, you can, you can start now. Yep. Good stuff. Um, Kesh, you were talking about um, the, the the scanning piece of, of this equation. Um, we, we have a question about um, once you know what's what's in or on your extended attack surface, what do you do with that information? Yeah, I mean, I think prior to, like I said before, prioritization is like the most critical sort of first step that you can take once you have the view of what's out there. Um, because almost invariably, companies find, okay, there's way more stuff than we can actually um, try to address right away. So some sort of a system for, you know, prioritizing the work that you want the team to do. And, um, and we help our customers with this in a couple of different ways. But in terms of the exposure issues, you can actually get a sense of what's the importance of the asset that we're looking at um, that, you know, this, this issue is on top of. And then also what's the relative severity of, of the issue that's here. Um, you know, and then being pretty ruthless about how you want to prioritize the work um, is critical to make sure that you can, you can make some meaningful progress. And then also having a good system where you can assign um, the tasks out to the team members that they need to go to. Because sometimes, you know, these tasks are going to be done by the security team, but other times, you know, it's actually somebody from the IT group or the marketing group that you need in order to, um, you know, make an update to something, pull something behind a firewall, patch a server, whatever the case might be. Um, so you need some sort of a workflow to go along with this to, you know, kind of track the status 
um, of whatever remediation that you're that you're trying to do. So, you know, my my recommendations would be start with prioritizing and and you know, kind of constantly prioritize, um, and then also make sure that you have a tight tracking of the work that you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then and then lastly, make sure that you're set up with some metrics um, that help you understand if you're making the progress that you want to make. Um, and uh, and keeping track of those to make sure that you know you're spending your energy in the right direction and it's having the the right overall impact on your security program um, is is critical as well. Vanessa, I would imagine maybe there's uh, a, another set of things that you would recommend looking at in terms of dealing with this in your vendor network. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, again, all of the, all of the things you said for your own enterprise apply for third party as well. There's just a little bit of a different take on it. Um, again, prioritization is going to happen on two levels, right? It's the, it's the vendor. <laughs> What's their relationship to you? How critical are they to different parts of your business? And what is like what does that mean in terms of um, inherent risk? Then you've got the issue of you know which issues are actually a problem. And so you can look at the ones that are known exploited. You can look at ones with different levels of severity, depending on the type of relationship that you have and prioritizing that way. Um, Again, a lot of the work is really going to come down to how you collaborate with those third parties who you are asking to do something, right? You want them to make a change in their environment. You want them to, um, you know, drive drive some improvement, and that takes work from them, but it also takes some influence from you. And so, if you have a way to share that information in a way that is um, helpful but also scalable for you, especially as your vendor population grows, as your third party population expands. Um, that can be really powerful. So I think those are kind of the things that I would say it's, yes, for sure, prioritization, um, but also make sure you have a good plan in place for collaborating with your third parties. Make sure you have a good plan in place for sharing information with them, but also tracking progress that they're making on their side. Because I think, especially when it comes to things like zero days or new critical vulnerabilities that have been, you know, highlighted, there's a, there's a real pressure on the first party organization to react and respond. And so the more helpful you can be as one of their customers, I think the, the better off you're going to be in terms of getting the, the clarity and the, the mitigation that you're looking for. Great stuff. Um, it, we also want to look at the, just the, the budgetary pressures that haven't really gone away um, before COVID, during COVID, and now in this allegedly post-COVID era that we're in. Um, Cash, how can companies do more um, with with less given given that um, no one's budgets are increasing everybody's looking over their shoulder for the next round of layoffs like it's 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 tense out there um, to what degree does this this solution that you're talking about really um, begin to sort of crack that nut a bit yeah so we I mean here, from many of our customers, uh, you know, particularly this year, I think a lot more companies out there are being um, very tight with their security budgets and security leaders are being asked to to do more with less, at least keep, um, you know, the amount that they're spending on tools flat or in some cases decrease that. Um, and so, you know, in, in a lot of cases, what our customers are, are trying to do is to solve multiple problems. Um, you know, with the with the products that they do license, and so that's one of the things that we aim to do at Bitsight is to help our customers solve a range of problems with the solutions that we provide. And you know, on this call today, we talked about you know, kind of solving exposure management issues um, for the for the infrastructure that you own yourself as an organization. Also, extending that across your supply chain, and then kind of on top of both of those things. Um, you know, adding another layer in, in the case of managing your own security program, it's about, you know, instilling good governance um, and good hygiene, uh, you know, across your entire program and being able to kind of report up and out about the strength of your of your program. Um, and then, you know, within your uh, your third party risk management program, being able to solve a range of, of problems, which extend all the way from you know, kind of the onboarding of a new vendor to the continuous monitoring of that vendor to make sure that um, if they do, you know, have a critical vulnerability that you need them to address, you can, you know, reach out to them and, and make sure that um, they can mitigate that. And so we are helping the majority of our customers across a spectrum of these 
problems. Um, and so we always aim when we're working with a customer, not just to, you know, only solve one particular problem, but, but help them in a number of different areas. And in some cases that allows them to, you know, rein back on some of the spend that they might have on, you know, other tools because they're able to kind of consolidate that into, um, you know, kind of one holistic approach with BitSight. I, I think the other angle that I would put on that question too is, you know, in a world where you're being asked to do more with less, again, like a lot of times the answer is prioritization. Um, and so making sure to prioritize the work that you do want to do and, and using strong tools to be able to identify, you know, here are the most critical issues that if we fix these, these are going to make the biggest impact. That helps you extend, um, you know, extend the team further and, and get more bang for the, for the buck in terms of the work that they're doing. Um, so I don't know, those are, those are some of the things that, uh, that I hear our customers asking about and some of the problems that I see as helping them to solve. Vanessa, I don't know if there's anything that, that you would add to that. Yeah, I think the only other point I would make is that in addition to prioritization, in addition to getting the benefit of a broader range of capability from one, from one platform, there's also a process efficiency benefit from using the same language to communicate across <laughs> across your cyber risk program. And so both from a first party and third party perspective, from a full sort of um, life cycle perspective, being able to use a single single framework, a single language can help you make sure that when you, when you apply standards or when you determine standards, you can actually hold to them and you can use that language within your organization. You can use it with your board. You can use it with your, um, with your stakeholders to make sure that you are speaking the same language. And that I think that reduces friction, it reduces confusion, and it helps you get efficiency um, just from a communication and process standpoint. And I think, again, in the spirit of getting to programs that are really streamlined, that's that's very powerful. Well, that is going to bring us to our time. Um, Greg Kishian and Vanessa Jankowski, thank you both for expanding our, our understanding and insight into exposure management and, and risk reduction. Thank you both very much. Thank you, appreciate it. My pleasure. I wanna thank our sponsor, BitSight, as well as everyone in the audience. We appreciate your participation and attention today. Sometime within the next 24 hours, you'll be receiving a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able to listen to today's live event. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Information Week and BitSight, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, BitSight, I'm Terry Sweeney for Information Week. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time.